All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another session of Meet the Methodologist. Uh, as you may know, uh, Karma brings in a series of distinguished uh, scholars over the course of the year to give webcast lectures. And um, we also take advantage of their presence uh, to try to engage them in uh, some informal conversation, getting their perspective on careers and research issues, uh, etc. Uh, and in case you don't know, uh, we post those on our YouTube channel. So when we're done here, this will be posted on the Karma YouTube channel, where you can also find uh, copies of um, past Meet the Methodologist sessions that we've done. And for those of you that are watching us live on Facebook today uh, for this testing uh, of our system, uh, we're glad that you've given us a chance and uh, we look forward to getting your feedback. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our three visitors for today. We have Rich Gonzalez uh, from the University of Michigan, Rick Hoyle from Duke University, and Kevin Carlson from Virginia Tech. So, uh, uh, fellas, it's great to have you here, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to join us and share your experience. So I'd just like to get it going by asking how it is you got interested in research methods. And kind of what we do is we'll alternate the order so that uh, nobody has to go first every time. Rick, would you mind uh, starting us off there? How did you get interested in research yeah, methods? Yeah, well, I went to graduate school in North Carolina in social psychology, and there's a very fine quantitative psychology group there and it had become the norm for social psychology students to minor in quantitative methods and for the quant faculty to be on students' committees. So there was a natural exposure to methodology. But I think the key point for me was a master's thesis in which I was interested in the moderating effects of self-esteem. And I chose a variety of measures of self-esteem and when it came time to analyze my data, I discovered I got different effects depending on which measure I used. And that got me to think, well, what if I factored and see if there's some common thread? And so that got me interested in factor analysis, and then ultimately I became interested in other late variable methods. Uh -huh. Rich, how about you? Uh, also in graduate school, I uh, was admitted to the social psychology program and taking all the standard social psychology courses, enjoying them. And then I started taking some methodology courses and really got excited, actually maybe even a little bit more so than the social psychology courses. And then I started working with an advisor who did a lot of math modeling. Um, and so I started thinking about questions about how do we measure things and how do we translate our psychological theories into uh, math models and how do we test those models. And so that's how I got interested in methods. Yeah. Okay. Kevin, how about you? Very good. Uh, I'm out of a business school, and so I've got a little different experience. Did my doctoral work at Iowa and worked with Frank Schmidt, and, and you don't leave that experience without at least some interest in methodology and some interest in trying to understand some of these questions. But what, that wasn't the, the really the push for me. It was much more when I moved to Virginia Tech. Uh, and started investigating the literatures and spending time that I realized that, that really the big issues and, and really the limitations weren't necessarily theoretical. It was much more in terms of, of how we understand trying to address questions. What's research progress mean to us? How do we do that? Uh, how do we use the methodologies we have to kind of advance ourselves? And so the, to me it was, a, it was a function of um, scanning kind of the horizon and realizing that the, the real fun places to be in terms of making progress in the substantive literature is probably we're much more on the, on the method side. Not necessarily statistics, but, but more in design and measurements and uh, those particular areas. And so I uh, took a sabbatical in 2007 and really spent that time kind of refocusing and, and uh, retooling back into a methodologist. And so I've spent more time doing that since then. I'm, I'm waiting for the day that I get back into more substantive kind of theory-based theory kinds of issues. But, uh, well, you know, it may not happen. It may not. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, who knows? But it's, but it's, uh, it really is that opportunity to recognize that the, that at least as I see them, that, that we, we can generate all kinds of theory, but it's really what we do with that methodologically in terms of testing and pushing ourselves forward and using our methods appropriately is the, 
is a real challenge, and, and making sure we understand them. I'm not sure we necessarily always understand our methods as well as we should. Yeah. Yeah. It creates issues for us. Well, each of you mentioned uh, graduate student days, so I'm wondering uh, if you had a favorite methods course, and if you have any particular memories about challenges in learning about STAT or methods uh, as a graduate student. And how about if we just have I'll, you continue? I'll, uh, I'll start. I, had, uh, I took uh, three courses from Frank Schmidt at Iowa. I took measurement uh, with him, meta-analysis with him, and staffing. And, and, uh, uh, measurement was always interesting because the, uh, Frank would come in first thing in class on a, on a daily basis and he would spend the first five minutes writing formulas on the board. <clears throat> and, and he would get all the formulas on the board and then he would take off in, into his discussion of the topic during the day and then he would turn around and point to the formula that fit in at that particular point in the conversation. And so it always made uh, note-taking particularly difficult because he wrote the formulas down ahead of time because they were really, it was going to take a while to do those things. And so we'd go flying past uh, some of these discussions and so by the time you get done your notes are these, uh, you write all the formulas down, you have arrows pointing to where they go as they work their way through and, and uh, grasping the concepts early on in a doctoral program is challenging enough and then trying to keep track of the notes. But it was. Uh, uh, I always, always remembered when it was all said and done, you'd finally get it, but it was very late in the conversation at some, some particular points in time. But it was, uh, those were always great. They, you recognized the challenge, you recognized the opportunity, and so it was fun. A little scary and a little uh, like riding roller coasters without seat belts maybe someday. But, uh, but a challenge, challenge nonetheless. Yeah. Rick, how about you? Well, I had the good fortune of taking a course with Kenneth Bowman in Structural Equation Modeling. and. This happened to be actually before his now classic book was published, so we used a preprint of his book, and uh, really it was a trans transformative experience for me. There was a sort of way of thinking about processes and mechanisms and models and data. And I, I think the struggle for me was I did not come with a strong math background, so I found myself early on swimming in matrix algebra and covariance algebra. And, trying to make heads or tails uh, out of it, which has made me more empathic toward my own students mm -hmm. now and sort of given me uh, cause to think about what I can do for them to help them overcome the same hurdle. Okay. Yeah. For me, the uh, course that stood out from graduate school days was my first statistics course in the stats department. And up until then, I thought statistics was sort of a set of rules that you follow. You know, If you have these kind of data, this is the technique you're supposed to use this type of research question, you do such and such. And uh, so I went to the SAS department and I took a course on sort of current topics, current research topics. And I got an inkling to sort of how to think about methods where methods themselves are the research topic. Mm -hmm. And so we were exposed to, for instance, the bootstrap technique, which was sort of just coming out um, at the time. And so that's one of the examples of the to hot topics in statistics. So we're learning about bootstrap and learning about some other other methods and we were learning it as as a scholarly topic. And then the challenge was then the second statistics course that I took, where I was quite humbled with the level of mathematics <laughs> that was involved. So it was a Bayesian statistics course. And uh, the first day of class, which is usually I'm used to the simple kind of get everybody up to speed, right? So the instructor did a, a motivating example, a toy example to get everybody on the same page. And it involved a multi or a, a multiple Dirichlet distribution with a triple integral. And he was writing all these things on the board. And I had absolutely no idea what was happening. But I stayed through, struggled through the course, and learned, learned quite a bit. So. Well, uh, as is true of um, many of our karma presenters, uh, the three of you uh, have both a mixture of substantive and methodological and quantitative interests. Uh, and as a result, you spend a fair amount of time reviewing substantive papers. And I wonder whether you just had any uh, reactions that you could share about uh, the common shortcomings that you see in those substantive uh, papers. And Rich, if you'd like to take the lead, sure. that'd be great. Um, I, I'm not sure if this qualifies as a shortcoming, but um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the papers I read tend to focus, in a sense, too much on the fancy statistical techniques and sort of emphasizing to the reader, uh, you know, look at all the new things that we tried. We did such and such technique and, and concentrating on the, uh, the statistical tool rather than in addition, making sure to convey what the data are about, like what did you observe in your study. 
Okay? I think this, the main shortcoming is that we've lost a little bit in our papers this ability to describe what we actually observe and then place the complicated statistical models that we run in almost a supporting role of, um, okay, I observe this, then as a punctuation at the end of the sentence, here's the p-value, instead of saying p-value front and center. Uh, but that's sort of a, a, a that's, we've lost this ability, I think, to describe what the data are telling us because we're focusing too much on the statistical models. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I would echo that. I get a lot of papers to review in which structural equation modeling is used, and, and I, even some will have structural equation modeling in the title, and I'm always a little taken aback by the fact that you would put a tool that you use to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to research hypotheses as part of the title of the paper. And the two things I look for in those cases are what I call hypothesis validity. And often, I mean, you sort of know when the method's leading the question and when the two don't map well onto each other. If you look at the model they ran, you work backwards, you don't really see the questions um, uh, mapping on. And then I also think about, and along the lines of what Rich was saying, Abelson's Statistics as Principal Argument book, which is a fantastic book I highly recommend to you. And his central argument is that when we write a manuscript, we're telling a story and we're bringing evidence to bear on a question. And really all statistics are, are, is a tool to produce evidence. And when you view it that way, then you tend to write the way that you just described, where statistics aren't leading the way. You're making an argument, and as it, as it contributes to the argument, you pull in the statistical information to support it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to echo again uh, the same kinds of issues. To me, it even, it even gets a little more problematic and that not only do the methods drive the conversation in the manuscripts, but the methods often frame the question in the first place. And, and we, you know, it's, that, uh, it's the, I've, you know, I've got a hammer and now everything looks like a nail, and so I've got a methodology, and so I use the methodology to go figure out what I want to ask. And a lot of the questions that we're trying to ask in that particular way aren't necessarily meaningful in the context of that research, uh, it's something new, but not necessarily well-grounded in terms of how does this move us forward. Uh, in some cases, we're, we fall in love with the methodology, and because we find something consistent with the methodology, it's very difficult to take and translate it back into something substantively meaningful about the foundations upon which we're building. And, and this question about how, does it, how do we think about that as progressing a particular literature or progressing our understanding of something. Just because I've got a statistically significant p-value doesn't help me in that particular context. So how do I, how do I, how do I make some substantive understanding of what's going on? And we've gotten very good at doing the rules, um, but not the translation back into you know, now that I've got the statistical evidence. What's what's it really mean substantively for, for these particular areas? And 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 I think that's a skill set that we need to, to recapture. We're really good at some of the other things, but I, I don't think we're as necessarily as good as we need to be that way. Uh, now I'd like to kind of have you uh, answer a similar type of question, but more uh, providing a commentary on uh, literatures and research methods and quantitative techniques uh, that you may follow. So do you think that there are topical uh, areas within the fields of research methods or quantitative analysis that we are doing a particularly good job of studying as methodologists or a particularly bad job uh, of investigating. So now kind of a commentary on methodological uh, research. Rick, would you like to? Well, again, I speak sort of from the perspective of someone who does late variable modeling, structural equation type analyses. And I think we've gotten much better, broadly speaking, with the concept of a late variable and how it can be used. and uh, using it effectively and strategically to, uh, to test hypotheses. So I'm pleased to see that. Um, uh, I think we still struggle a bit with what counts as significant, even all the way back to the t-test. There's the p-value, but then there's the question of, but is it really a significant difference? And I think that gets compounded and magnified when you deal with these large models and, and the question of, does it fit, for example? even broader than that, then even if it fits, is it significant in the sense that it accounts for, in a compelling way, what it's trying to model? Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, how about you? The, the, uh, I guess I've got a couple, I'll approach it in a couple ways. One of them is that I think 
uh, the advent of the journals that have given us a, a, a nice outlet for methodological contributions has helped the field, I think, move along in a lot of fronts. So I, I think we're seeing more of uh, the kinds of research and understanding our methodologies and applications of our methodologies finding outlets. And so org research methods and psychological methods and, and two or three other journals I think are, are giving us more of that where we're not competing against substantive kinds of, of uh, issues that we may, we may be going the other, other way though and making it even harder to get more methodological kinds of contributions that these other journals made. That's, a, that's a, an issue for us to tackle otherwise. Um, but it, you know, for me, it's the, the, as I look at what's going on, to me the, the really most interesting question is, is how do we make progress? And, and as I look at the literature, I get most uncomfortable if I had to provide a pretty meaningful understanding of what's it mean to make progress in research literature, and if I had to point to what we do in research and argue how we're making progress, I, I struggle in, in that particular endeavor. I, I struggle to connect our methodologies with, with kind of a, a, a meaningful narrative on what it means to make progress. And, and, I, and if I had to find an area where I think we could do more as methodologists to kind of address the question, it's, a, it's the meeting of methods and theory development that, that uh, you know, you, you start to see some people kind of delving into that area in the fringes and, and you see it in the discussion boards and some of the sessions, but I think it's, it's ultimately kind of critical because research methodology for research methodology say isn't necessarily an outcome. It's if research progress is meaningful, then the question is, is how do we align our methodologies with that outcome? And, and I, personally, I struggle with that. And I'm guessing maybe there's some other folks who do as well, but I think it's absolutely critical for the field that we come to some understanding of what that is and how to deal with that. Okay. Yeah, I would echo that also. Uh, I describe it as sort of the, the tension between doing research in methodology and then making sure that the methods that you're developing connect with the substantive questions that people are asking. And it's for the methodology as a field to progress, we need both. I mean, we need individuals developing extensions and generalizations, uh, developing new tools, and uh, without regard to, you know, with the applications so just basic science and methods. Uh, but then for those, the basic science to really sort of be useful in some sense, I think it needs to connect to uh, the broader questions in, in social science. And sometimes you get ideas about directions in which your basic science as a methodologist should go into. So the, uh, as substantive questions start pushing the envelope of existing techniques, there might be sort of gold nuggets there and giving you ideas as a methodologist for where, which directions you should go in developing your own basic science. So it's, it's a tension because there's actually pressures from career development and granting agencies to do one or the other in different combinations in different settings for different audiences. Yes. Uh, uh, because of your positions, uh, each of you has spent a, a lot of time working with doctoral students, and I'm wondering whether you have some kind of standard uh, advice that you offer to the new students that you would encounter uh, as to what's critical for uh, their success uh, as a as a scholar. Rick, would you like to? Yeah, well, uh, a line my students hear from me very often is that we're writers, which I think is an interesting way to think about who who we are as social scientists. That that we're not data collectors, we're not data analysts. That at the end of the day. Uh, our work sees an audience when it becomes a written document. And it's easy to lose sight of that, I think, particularly when you become very consumed by methods. And my way of managing that is that any time I teach a methods class, it has a, it has a strong writing component to it. And I want you to know, I want you to understand the technical side of the methodology and how it works. But ultimately, I want you to be able to articulate what it is and its value and, and put it in the context of a broader story about some interesting question and how it sheds light on it. Yeah, well, I, uh, I tell my first year students the, uh, they should take as many methods courses as possible. <laughs> uh, the, it's typically what I tend to find is that students on their own can read the, the substantive literature. And, uh, but it's difficult for them on their own to learn new methods. 
And so I started to say, optimize that ability in graduate school and take methods courses and uh, make sure that you can connect the methods to the, to the substantive areas. Okay. I'd agree with that. That's, that's one of the pieces that uh, our, we got a, our business doctoral programs are four years after masters, but uh, the masters is a professional degree, and so we're bringing people back in who really don't necessarily have strong research foundations, and so we lay out courses of study for the first two years that both cover substantive issues and methodological issues. Uh, but, but the underlying meth message is you're here for four years, it's not going to get easier to learn methodology on your own when you leave. Uh, you're not going to have more time to go study these methods later on, and you've got the opportunity now in a context to, to expand yourself as much as you can. And I, and I agree that it's much more difficult to learn these things on your own. Uh, if you can be introduced to them in some kind of a classroom context, it really, it really makes it easier to come back and fill in the pieces later uh, that you've got some foundations. The other, the other things we, we tell them, or at least the two things I think are important, is for them to, to study broad and think very broadly, but, but or to think broadly but study very narrow. Is that be willing to, to read broadly, investigate, draw upon as much as you can to, to identify what you want to study, but when it comes time to study, develop very narrow, very focused designs. Is that, is, I think especially early on, uh, the fault they get into is trying to, I want to, I want to develop the ultimate study and it's got to have lots of variables and lots of effects and lots of things going on and, and especially early in your career, it's just hard to manage all of that. I'd, I'd much rather have them be nar very narrow, identify a critical question, a single critical question that they can address very well and, and do that. And, and so feel free to think really broadly, but when it comes time to study, pick one thing and then, and then really focus on it and then do it well. And then the second piece of advice is be a good carpenter. Uh, good carpenters measure twice and cut once and, and when they're developing studies, I really want them to spend the upfront time. But make sure you understand the design, make sure you do the thinking, really have thought through your methodologies and protocols and, and do as much hard work as you can there because everything else after that becomes much easier. And, and it's, it's about cycling through this process. We learn more, but I think if you, can, if you can narrow the workload, don't try to tackle too much, but try to do what you really do very well. Uh, at least early on, it, it allows you to cycle through the system more often. You learn more as you work through each of those cycles, and I think it kind of ramps them up a little more. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, you're here to give a webcast lecture this afternoon. And so I was wondering if you just take a minute and uh, uh, comment on the origins of why the topic and uh, a 60-second summary of it. Rich? Uh, I'm talking about visualization in both data and models. And the origin of that topic came out through several experiences I've had in my teaching where students uh, sort of because I spent so much time explaining the techniques, sort of how to do ANOVA regression, uh, how to compute p-values and so on, confidence intervals. Um, they sort of take away the message that that must be the important part of data analysis is computing these p-values. And um, so what I've done in my teaching is I've tried to emphasize in addition sort of understanding what patterns are in the data. And that is pretty easy if you have simple cases like two groups or two variables, you can look at a scatter plot. But if you have you know, 12 variables or more, uh, and there's longitudinal aspects to that, those 12 variables, and the, the variables might come from different members of the same team or the same family, you might have a multi-level structure, how do you visualize that complicated pattern? And so I'm working on some three-dimensional tools on, uh, using computer graphics to be able to visualize complicated patterns in data and then simultaneously to superimpose the statistical models that we're running on those data onto the same graphical device so you can see the match between the observations and the model fits. Yeah. So you can assess goodness of fit visually. Uh, okay, Rick, how about you? I'll be talking about the use of structural equation methods to analyze data generated by longitudinal designs. Uh, in Part of what motivates that focus for me is I think folks perhaps under uh, analyze longitudinal data or they fail to extract all the meaningful and interesting information that might be extracted from those designs and particularly the more assessments, the more that's going on that could be modeled. 
I'll touch on sort of three classes of hypotheses or questions one might ask. Stability of a construct over time, sort of causality to the extent that the design involves two or more constructs, and then patterns of change over time, and then particularly models that integrate all three of those concerns in one model. Okay. I'm, I've been a, a great uh, interested observer in the, the series of sessions that have been done in the last conferences that take on these myths and legends in, in the statistical analysis and research process. And, and uh, I love those. I'm, I'm suspicious of rules of thumb, uh, that, that they're easy mechanisms to, to teach researchers on how they begin, but it's but a lot of cases that it's the rules of thumb are based on certain kinds of assumptions, and we remember the rules of thumb and we forget the assumptions, and as a consequence, we generalize the rules of thumb into places where they're problematic. And so uh, I'm going to be talking about some things that are related to a foundation on joint variance, the, the shared variance that the IVs have in the relationship with the dependent variable and the consequences that it has for us in a number of circumstances. And, and I'm going to pull two of those out. One is the use of control variables in, in uh, uh, to you in, in, for using them for statistical control and, and analyses, and, and the, the title is Things We Thought We Knew, and part of this kind of takes on some of the general rules of thumb and kind of the, what we describe as the universal playbook and the use of control variables in, in uh, quasi-experimental and non-experimental designs and what we think they do and, and what they actually do. Um, and, and we do that, and, and then a related piece is we uh, jump over in, in much more macro research, we see the use of the variance inflation factor as, a, as an argument against the presence of multicollinearity in data sets. And so we kind of unpack that. Again, it's a variance inflation factor is a way to try to get at joint variance and try to understand the potential consequences. And, and so we pull that apart a little bit and talk about what's going on. And bottom line is, is uh, we'll argue that unless you've got a really good reason to do so and you know exactly what's going to happen, we wouldn't recommend using control variables uh, in research studies to, to accomplish statistical control, and the variance inflation factor really isn't protecting you much. And so we'll unpack those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, the last thing, uh, if you don't mind uh, sharing a little bit of your personal uh, side of things, I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, if there's anything special that you do that, uh, that inspires you or motivates you for your work. And maybe what are the, the things that you like the most and, uh, and like the least about your gig? So, uh, Rich, you interested in this starting with it? Oh, sure. That's a, that's a big one. <laughs> that's a big uh, question. Uh, well, the part I like the least about academic life in general are all the emails. <laughs> uh, yeah, so just dealing with, with the, the emails. And, um, and usually emails involve uh, a lot, it's not just spam, it's the, uh, the, the work, because yeah, emails come with attachments, <laughs> and usually those attachments involve maybe a couple of hours of editing a manuscript or, or some sort, so yeah, just the, the emails. And what, what I like the most about my job is, is the ability to sort of follow my own intellectual interests. I, mean, I really cherish that freedom to be able to do that, that uh, as I learn new things and I, I want to incorporate new concepts, new tools, new paradigms and theories. Um, I have the flexibility to do that if I think that it might pay off mm -hmm. in, my, in my research. So that was the second part of your question. Yeah, what is we have the some, anything part. special you do for inspiration or motivation? Um, well, yeah, usually some physical activity. <laughs> so right now it's bicycling. I've taken up cycling. Um, so I've been going on some long rides and, and uh, now that the weather has turned bad, I've, uh, I've turned cycling into a commuting. So I commute to work my bike. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts when it starts to snow. But I'm going to try. I'm going to try and commute my bike all winter. Okay. Uh, Rick, how about you? Well, I think uh, it's easy for me to stay interested and motivated. I'm surrounded by smart students and smart faculty colleagues. And uh, I really count on my students to keep me interested and engaged. Uh, one thing I do say to them is that we don't generally get ideas, we don't stay interesting by immersing ourselves in the literature. We do that by observing what's going on around us and interesting things happening in the world. So a lot of our lab meetings focus on you know, what's happening, 
what's happening around us, when's the last time you saw this, what do you think was going on there, trying to that sort of interest in the world versus what's the next little piece of the literature we might be able to uh, do something with, drive what we, uh, we do. Uh, I detest meetings, particularly meetings that are poorly run and, and it might be unnecessary, so I think that that along with email is probably uh, one of my pet peeves. Uh, I do love to write. I like to get lost in a manuscript. It's easy to get lost surfing the web and doing lots of other things, but I love it when I look up and I've been working a couple hours on a manuscript and didn't realize uh, that much time had passed. It's sort of why I got into this kind of work. I'm going to echo the problems. It's the, the administrative work, committee work, uh, the 50, 60, 70 emails a day that will be waiting for me when I, when I pull back in. My, my idea of an ideal cell phone is one that only calls out. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, the, that's the, uh, in industry, that I, I spent eight years in industry, and, and industry expect that kind of constant background noise and constant shift back and forth. What's great about it in academic life is you can pull out Lots of time. There's autonomy if you can, if, if we can develop kind of the uh, uh, the, the purposefulness to be able to f force things out and give you that, give yourself that opportunity. It's, it's absolutely great, uh, and it's a it's a job I'll, I don't I can't imagine retiring from because it's uh, it's it, it's not physically hard, but it's unbelievably intellectually engaging. There's always some new conversations coming out where around smart colleagues and smart students on a consistent basis and they keep rotating by us and so there's always something new to kind of think about and do and so I think it's, uh, it's a great fit having that autonomy to kind of spend some time the way we want to and, and always have lots of ways to get charged and uh, in whatever way, whether, whether it's really excited or really irritated or whatever else the case might be, it's just a fun place to, fun place to be. So. Well, we are uh, very excited uh, to have you here and greatly appreciate you taking the time this morning uh, to share your views on research and other related matters. And uh, again, let me invite you to visit the other Meet the Methodologist interviews that we have on our uh, Karma YouTube channel. Uh, also, if you're coming from a Karma member school, uh, you probably know that we have over 70 uh, one-hour lectures by uh, very distinguished methodologists on a wide range of topics, and we invite you to visit our website uh, to get more information about that. And for those of you that have joined us on Facebook today, uh, we're very happy about that, and uh, we want to invite you to... What do we say? Friend us or like us or like us. Show us uh, how you feel about things. How about that? But, uh, but thanks again, uh, fellows, for your time. Rich, thank you. Thank you. Yep, Kevin. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, we hope to uh, have you tune in in the future. Thanks.